This is Africa News Tonight on The Voice of America. Hello and welcome. Welcome to VOA Africa. Thank you for joining us. I'm Yehiyas Wuhib in Washington. Here's what's coming up on Africa News Tonight. He says a group of African heads of state want to put forward a peace initiative that could contribute to a solution to the Russia-Ukraine conflict. That was a report of Vicky Stark on a plan for an African diplomatic effort with Ukraine and Russia. Details coming up. Also, the number of Sudanese refugees in Chad has doubled. And the rape trial of Senegalese opposition leader Osman Sonko is postponed. These stories and more on African News tonight. We start with our top story. Despite ceasefire talks in Saudi Arabia, shelling and airstrikes have been pounding parts of Sudan's capital with little sign that warring military factions are ready to back down in a month-long conflict that has killed hundreds. Repeated truce deals have been broken while the United States and Saudi Arabia are mediating talks in Jeddah aimed at securing a lasting ceasefire. The fighting has caused a humanitarian crisis that threatens to destabilize the region, displacing more than 700,000 people inside Sudan and forcing about 200,000 to flee into neighboring countries. Joseph Siegel, director of research at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies, tells VOA senior analyst Mohamed El Shanawi that stability in Sudan is crucial for neighboring countries and the Horn of Africa. Sudan holds a unique place in the geography of Africa. It's a keystone state bordering seven other countries. It also links North Africa to Central and East Africa. It links Africa to the Arab world. So there are all these cross-cutting linkages that Sudan represent. And we've already seen that instability in Sudan has had ripple effects on all of its neighbors. And the region was already facing high levels of instability, with every one of those neighbors recently facing conflict themselves or some other form of political crisis. And so the capacity to absorb these shocks coming out of Sudan and to serve as a buffer is very low. And so this could very much have a destabilizing effect on the rest of the region. But is weaker Sudan good for Ethiopia? In the end, I don't think a weaker Sudan is good for any of the neighbors because it creates a security risk. Specifically with regards to Ethiopia, there has not been a long-standing animosity between Sudan and Ethiopia. For the most part, there have been cordial relations. I think the Ethiopians realize their, their economic development is hinged to broader stability in Sudan. And in fact, specifically with regards to the development of you know, the Grand uh, Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, that part of the plan there is that Ethiopia would be able to sell the electricity generated to Sudan and other neighboring countries, that there would be some cooperation in terms of managing the, the flows of the Nile. So I don't see that Ethiopia has a lot to gain from instability in Sudan. The obvious critical aspect of the Sudanese crisis is the willingness of the conflicting parties to engage in a protracted and extensive military confrontation. How and when would the two generals realize that there is no military solution and they have to negotiate? You know, it's possible that each side thought that they could have scored an early knockout blow, but now realizing that that's not possible and seeing the devastating cost and the fact that even if they were to be victorious militarily, that they are the ones who would have to pick up the pieces, and maybe that they're going to be more open to finding alternative ways out. It's also possible that each side had made a miscalculation, that they didn't really want the conflict, but that they misinterpreted the other, other the moves on the other side, and that they proactively took action so that they didn't face some sort of coup from the other side. So in the same way, they may be receptive to finding a negotiated settlement. Now, it is possible that or both sides believe that they can win a war of attrition and that even if isolated politically, you know, drawing on the example of Assad in Syria, that they can hang on and eventually gain an external factor and come out on top. I think that's a highly unrealistic outcome, and Sudan is starting from a much more fragile place than, than Syria did 
you know, Sudan has had a contracting economy for the last decade because of the predatory mismanagement of the country by the military government. It faces huge debts, hyperinflation, you know, more than 300 percent and very little popular support. This was before the conflict. And so those structural factors can't be ignored. You know, there are major reason why the military government was begrudgingly involved in the negotiation for a transition, and they will continue to be pressure points on both sides of this military conflict to move forward. And these are points that civilian actors and external actors need to continue to reinforce to both of the rival generals as these negotiations continue. What is needed from the international community to prevent the escalation and to end the armed conflict in Sudan? There needs to be a clear signal to the generals that there isn't a path forward for them to emerge as a new head of state in Sudan. Moreover, they could emphasize that the personal safety of the generals and their families themselves are at stake the longer that this conflict persist. And so they should be looking at ways to de-escalate. And in fact, external actors can help with negotiations on places the generals could go as part of negotiation uh, and comfortably uh, move into exile. There are other messages and steps that are needed. I think it's important for military advisors to these generals, as well as their respective tribal leaders, to emphasize that the cost of this conflict are exceeding any gains that they hope to achieve and that a serious negotiation and bringing this conflict to an end is in the best interest of Sudan and Sudanese. That was Joseph Siegel, Director of Research at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies, speaking with VOA's Mohamed El Shenawi. United Nations agencies are appealing to international donors to scale up support and funding to provide education for Sudanese children who have been displaced from their homes. The agencies say education will help protect the refugee children from multiple risks and exploitation. Lisa Schlein reports from Geneva. The latest protection monitoring reports show about half of the families arriving from Sudan into Chad have school-aged children. The UN Refugee Agency, UNHCR, says 83% of these children had been attending schools in Sudan before they were forced to flee. UNHCR spokeswoman Olga Sarado says it is crucial that they continue their education as soon as possible. She says school protects children from many risks they are likely to face while in exile. Child protection, child marriage, uh, early marriage is one of the main concerns that we have, especially in in Chad, of those children that are arriving, as well as uh, child labor. And that's why we're making all the efforts from the start of the emergency to include school as part of the priorities, uh, priority responses. Yasmin Sharif is executive director of Education Cannot Wait, the UN Global Fund for Education in Emergencies and Protracted Crises. She participated in a high-level field mission with UNHCR and UNICEF to the border regions of Chad with Sudan, where 60,000 refugees recently arrived. She says children account for nearly 70% of the pre-registered refugees. She says the children who had arrived in the past few days with their parents and grandparents were deeply traumatized and terrified by their experience. The children said they had to hide during the day because they were being pursued during their flight by the rebels waging war in western Darfur. She says children in Sudan have not gone to school for the past six months for fear of being killed, kidnapped, sexually abused and recruited as child soldiers by the warring parties. She says parents around the world want their children to go to school so they have a chance to create better lives for themselves. When we spoke to them, uh, the the first thing they asked for is water, uh, shelter, food, and education. Education is just as important to them. And you can embed water, food, and shelter and protection in education. You, you get, uh, 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 you get uh, uh, interconnected um, components of all of this by providing education, but also giving, giving them a hope for the future. Sharif says her agency is allocating $3 million as an initial grant to provide an education for newly arriving children in Chad. 
But she notes much more money than that will be needed to get the growing number of Sudanese refugee children back to school. Since conflict erupted between the Sudanese army and paramilitary rapid support forces on April 15th, more than 200,000 people have fled to the Central African Republic, Chad, Egypt, Ethiopia, and South Sudan. The UNHCR estimates this number could reach 860,000, including hundreds of thousands of children. Lisa Schlein for VOA News, Geneva. The UN Refugee Agency, UNHCR, says the number of people who fled from Sudan to Chad has doubled to 55,000 in the last week, and many are women and children. Henry Wilkins spoke to Sudanese refugees who just arrived at the newly created camp in Borota, Chad. Aid groups are struggling to help 25,000 refugees who arrived in Chad from Sudan last week. The recent influx has almost doubled the number of Sudanese refugees in the country since the Sudan civil war began April 15th. To reach the site of a camp housing the new arrivals, VOA flew from the capital, Enda Jamina, and then drove four hours to the remote town of Barota on the chad Sudan border. Here, a settlement that didn't exist a week ago is now the size of a town. The refugees have come from western Darfur, which has been ravaged by lawlessness and intercommunal violence mostly consisting of ethnically Arab armed groups terrorising black Sudanese. Sudan's conflict triggered the spate of violence. Refugee Khadija Abeb Abdul Rahman told VOA how it is she arrived at Barota. She said she's coming from the town of Conga because of the fighting. There are a lot of terrorists there and that's why so many refugees have fled. She adds that the small bundle she is carrying on her head is all she was able to bring with her. She is in need of food and security. Meanwhile, Isaac Bakar says he has been living in Barota since last week. He describes seeing a group of armed men raiding his hometown of Conga before he fled. He says they were breaking into people's houses to steal money, and if you didn't have money they forced you out of your home and sent people south or killed them. He says he saw them killing people, and that if he had a phone he would have recorded it. The mayor of Barota, Toko Bahat, says he is happy to welcome the refugees as his guests and points out his community has strong ties with those across the border, but resources are strained. He says people need a lot of help with food and especially water. Because there's no rain, there is a scarcity. There are also children in need of assistance and refugees who have no jobs. UNHCR is putting basic sanitation in place and bringing water, but warns there is still much to do. Eugene Buyun is a UNHCR spokesperson. The need is great and uh, our support is uh, minimized because of a funding shortfall. We really calling for international community to support and continue to support to those in your rivals. Chad's rainy season starts this month. The deep gullies on the road to Barotta will fill with water, making access for aid groups more difficult. Henry Wilkins for VOA News, Barotta. The Fund says sub-Saharan Africa has some of the world's highest rates of preterm births. Mavis Ochera in Juwaso, in the Ashanti region of Ghana, has more on the story. UNICEF says sub-Saharan Africa accounts for 10% of preterm babes compared to Southern Asia, which accounts for 13%. The number of newly babes in Africa increased from 3.3 million in 2010 to 3.9 million in 2020. Globally, an estimated 13.4 million babies were born prematurely in 2020, with nearly 1 million dying from complications. Gagan Gupta is a UNICEF senior advisor for maternal, newborn children, and adolescent health. He says the situation is dire, noting that it has remained unchanged over the last 10 years. Preterm births, he says, are the leading cause of child deaths. There are multiple factors, so the approach has to be multi-pronged. First thing is delaying the age of marriage and the age of pregnancy. If children are giving birth to children, 
the adolescent girls are still children and when adolescent girls become pregnant their body is not prepared to bear the burden of pregnancy he says other factors have also led to an increased number of deaths among infants in the region for example health facilities lack the resources needed to handle preterm births also contributing to the problem are air pollution stress, and climate change with increasing temperatures recorded in many parts of south asia and africa gufta says pregnant mothers ought to take their nutrition seriously and receive the needed health care and support during pregnancy they should also be encouraged to use skin to skin contact with exclusive breastfeeding known as kangaroo mother care an approach which helps to keep the baby warm and grow as well gufta underscored the importance of close monitoring of preterm babies in the early part of their lives he says the new report by unicef and other un agencies called born too soon decade of action on preterm calls for urgent action to improve prevention and care for preterm babies he says over the last five to six years progress made in the area of maternal and newborn survival has stagnated and the gains made are reversing as the covid 19 pandemic caused the reduction in financing in some countries to maternal and newborn health gufta says although deliveries in health facilities have increased globally by 80 percent four out of ten women in sub-saharan africa still deliver at home and the situation in sub-saharan africa is between the two regions of western central africa and eastern south africa region the western central africa still is lagging more behind so what we need to do is improve the coverage of antenatal care make sure it is not just antenatal care but blood pressure is taken the mother is given proper dietary advice mother is given micronutrients and when the pregnancy and delivery happens she reaches the health facility in time he says governments on the continent must acknowledge the gravity of the situation and adopt a multi-sectorial approach to solve it. Reporting for VOA, this is May Visotri in Jasto in the Ashanti region of Ghana. Proceedings in the rape case against Senegalese opposition leader Osman Sonko has been adjourned until next week. Reporter Alfa Jallo in Dakar has more. Opposition leader Usman Sonko did not appear in the court in Dakar today when his trial opened. Shortly afterwards, the judge postponed further proceedings until May 23rd. The case is considered most publicized rape allegation in Senegal history. Sonko is leader of Pastive Patriots Party. He is accused of raping Ajira Bissar, who worked at a massage saloon in Dakar and making death threats against her. If Sonko is convicted, he faces up to 10 years in prison and would be barred for running for president. Sonko has denied all allegations and said they are intended to keep him from running for the presidency. Yesterday, there were violent protests in both the capital city, Dakar, and the Zikansol, the, the regional capital of the southern provinces of Kasamas, where Sonko is mayor. At least three people, including a police officer, were reported killed in the unrest, and protesters vandalized several businesses. Sonko recently received a six month suspended prison sentence and was fined 200 million CFA francs in a defamation case against the Minister of Tourism. He is appealing that case. Reporting for VOA News, this is Alpha Jallo in Dakar. South African President Cyril Ramaphosa says a delegation of African leaders will soon travel to Russia and Ukraine to present a peace plan. Vicky Stark reports from Cape Town, South Africa. President Cyril Ramaphosa's announcement of the planned trip came Tuesday during a media briefing with Singaporean Prime Minister Lee Hsien Long. He says a group of African heads of state want to put forward a peace initiative that could contribute to a solution to the Russia-Ukraine conflict. We have 
been talking about as African leaders because we concluded that that conflict in that part of the world, much as it does not affect Africa directly in the form of deaths and uh, destruction to our infrastructure, it does have an impact on the lives of many Africans. With regard to food security, the prices of fertilizers have gone up, prices of cereals have gone up, and the prices of fuel. Ramaphosa says he spoke to Presidents Putin and Zelensky, who agreed that they would be willing to receive a mission of the African heads of state in both their capitals, Moscow and Kiev. In addition to South Africa, Zambia, Senegal, Congo, Brazzaville, Uganda and Egypt are all part of the initiative. The talks have been facilitated by the Brazzaville Foundation, a London-based non-profit organization that focuses on conflict resolution. Ramaphosa says preparations for the meetings to take place as soon as possible have already begun. Both the Secretary General of the United Nations and the African Union have been briefed on the plan. Vicky Stark for VOA News, Cape Town, South Africa. The Supreme Court of Namibia has ruled in favor of recognizing same-sex marriages from other countries, making Namibia only the second nation on the continent to do so after South Africa. Vitalio Anguela reports from Windhoek, Namibia. A small group of LGBTQ activists gathered at Namibia's Supreme Court Tuesday where justices ruled in a 4-1 to one vote that Namibians married to foreign nationals in foreign jurisdictions must be recognized as any other couple within the country. One of the judges, J.A. Mainga, dissented on the basis that the laws of Namibia do not recognize same-sex relationships. The other four judges, however, ruled that not recognizing same-sex couples infringes on their rights to dignity and equality. VOA spoke to the legal counsel of the same-sex couples, Carly Schrickling, who appealed an earlier judgment of the High Court of Namibia not to recognize their same-sex marriages. Today, after a six-year battle, we finally won and uh, the court has ruled that the Ministry of Home Affairs has to recognize these marriages by foreign spouses to Namibian spouses. Over the past few months, the Supreme Court of Namibia has been hearing similar cases that deal with the subject of homosexuality. In one case, a Namibian citizen, Friedel Dausab, is asking for the repeal of an anti-sodomy law. In another case, which was dismissed in March, a Mexican national and his Namibian partner asked the top court to grant Namibian citizenship to their child, conceived through surrogacy in South Africa. The Mexican national in that case, Guillermo Delgado, spoke to VOA outside the Supreme Court on Tuesday. Our case is very similar, and this represents a direct victory also for us. It's recognition of our marriage and our dependence. Linda Bauman of the Diverse Women's Organization said... This judgment will help homosexual couples get access to the same services as heterosexual couples. Hypothetically speaking, she said, as a lesbian woman, she could bequeath her estate to her lesbian partner when she dies. Or she might be able to buy a house together with a same-sex spouse if the court gave rights to same-sex couples in all spheres of society. She cautioned that this is just a ruling. It's important to understand firstly the case, the status of this case. It's couples that are coming back to this country to... uh, um, claim their right to equality, their right to dignity, the right to family. But to answer the question on same-sex marriages, I believe that a lot of LGBT people in this country, we experience a number of inequalities in service, in benefits, in